a series rebellious because we are all rebels, right? Uh, I had somebody just uh, Facebook me the other day and say, hey, we're, we're at MJR at the movie theater and we're being rebellious because we're bringing the snacks in there, right? We have, we, we have a rebellious nature about us. Uh, several years ago, I, uh, I actually lost a bunch of weight. I know, it's hard to imagine. I didn't used to be skinny. That was a joke. Okay, so several years ago, I actually did lose a bunch of weight, and, um, and so I kind of had like losing weight down. I understood how to do it, you know, and, I, and if, I, if I do it, I, I can do it, right? That's probably how most of us are. And uh, so one day, uh, I, it was just one of those weird days where I hadn't eaten anything, and it was a long day at church, and I went to the church building, and there was this chocolate cake, right? And, and I just, I was hungry and I knew I should eat something healthier, but I honestly just didn't have time. So I, I got a slice of the cake and I ate it and it was like, it was like heaven. Like, you know, like as good as one of my children. Like if I had to choose between, you know, I mean, anyway, this cake was absolutely wonderful. So, and because I hadn't eaten anything all day, I took another slice of the cake, right? And I ate, ate that piece of cake. And then I thought... I'm going to take some home to my wife. So I took a big old wedge, you know, and I thought she'd appreciate this. So I'm going to take this wedge home so she can enjoy it and so the kids can enjoy it. And honestly, that was what I was going to do. So I went to get some saran wrap, and now I'm in this kitchen full of ladies who have been watching me eat this cake, right? The 20, 30 ladies. Big event going on. And I go to cut this third slice, and a lady from across the room says, Grant Agler, do you really think you need another piece of cake? Just right in front of everybody. Now here's the thing. I wasn't going to eat that piece of cake. I had no inclination. I was already sick from eating two pieces of cake. But I'm a free bird, right? And so I, I just, I don't respond well to that kind of thing. So I said to her, she said, are you really going to eat that piece of cake? And I said, well, not without some coffee. And I... <laughs> I poured my coffee and I ate that entire wedge of cake looking at her. <laughs> you know, anybody else like that? Anybody, you get told not to, yeah, when it comes to cake, I know, but number two, when you get told to do something, you actually don't respond well, you, you go the other direction. We are like that as people, we are rebellious. And God knows we're rebellious and so he has, uh, he has made up for that. He's like, acclimated himself to be able to take the fall for our rebelliousness. And so we've been making the point that God knows that we're rebellious and he's been, he's been changing what he does or he's been uh, making up for our rebelliousness. So what he did was he gave up his life. And, and now there, Jesus came to get rid of the rules. Jesus came rid of, get rid of the laws. Most people don't realize that. Most people look at a church or they look at Jesus or they see a crucifix and they think there's a bunch of rules, a bunch of laws. But Jesus actually came to do the exact opposite. He came to get rid of or take that burden of those laws off of us so that we can be in our good relationship with him. And so now the only requirement that he has is what? That we just believe. That's it. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, here's why that's such a big deal. Because it goes so counter to what most people think about Christianity. Most people have this view of God, what I would call the, um, like, the Looney Tunes view of God. Right? So how many people watch Looney Tunes when you're a kid? Loved loved Looney Tunes. I would watch it all morning and then I would go into my room and try to do the voices, you know, I killed the wabbit, I killed the wabbit, and I loved, loved Looney Tunes. But the thing about, the thing about Bugs Bunny is, what happens when he dies? Bugs Bunny goes to heaven, right? The wings, the halo, he goes to heaven. And why does he go to heaven? Because he's good. That's, that's the theory. He's good. Now, he's not perfectly good. He kind of has a tendency to dress up like a woman a lot. I don't know if <laughs> A little transvestite thing going on. But I mean, he's basically good, right? So he goes to heaven. Now, where does Yosemite Sam go when he dies? Every time Yosemite Sam plunges through the crust of the earth, lands in hell. And the devil's down there waiting for him, you know? So that's, that's where Yosemite Sam... And why does he go there? Because he is he's bad. And that is what most people think God does when he judges everybody on the earth. 
He looks down and he goes, there's good people and there's bad people. And that's honestly what we believe that the Bible is saying. And that's not what the Bible teaches at all because that is based on rules, right? It's based on like laws. So you have these commands and you know, you want to get a good grade on these commands or you want to follow these rules. And so most of us in life uh, are, are either overachievers or underachievers, but you know, there might be some of you, like you're just trying to pass, right? You're just trying to get a D in life. That's, that's the goal, to try to get a D. Some of you are overachievers. You're trying to get an A, you know? And that's the objective. We're going to work at it and we're going to like, we're going to obey eight of the 10 commandments. So that's like what? It's like an 80%, right? <laughs> that's good, you know? And that's what Bugs Bunny and Yosemite Sam and everything around there and, and people, that's how they view life. It's like if I'm just basically a good person based on the rules that exist, then I will be with God or I will be in heaven. But that is not at all what the Bible teaches. In fact, the Bible teaches that we're all Yosemite Sam's, right? We, we're all like destined for destruction because we're all just across the board bad. And you know what? I love that. That's my favorite part of the gospel because it's fair, right? Think about, think about people that were raised in homes, right? Who didn't have good opportunities, who maybe, maybe had parents that just weren't there for them, that never got tight, taught right from wrong. They grow up, a lot of times they're, you know, bad. They, they have a disadvantage. They're not going to make it or they're not going to be in a good relationship with God because of the situation they're in in life. And so we have this system that's kind of based on that Looney Tunes model. But this is what I love. Jesus comes along and he says, no, you're all on an even playing field. Every last one of you, bad. All you have to do is believe, okay? So we've been trying to sink that home every week. And uh, I feel like sometimes I'm up here as a salesman going, really? No, that's all it is. You just got to believe. And when we believe, what happens? God changes who we are. God does a work in our life. He turns us into a new creation. So... As we've been going through that, or you hear that, I think there's a couple questions that you have. A couple questions. These are in your bulletin. These are a couple questions that I think just naturally go this direction. The first question you have is, okay, so if it's really all about belief, and all i got to do is believe, then can I just believe and, like, check that box and, and I'm good? Is that all i got to do? So, I mean, I just... I just believe, you know, whatever I have to go through, I go to church and I, you know, say the prayer and I get baptized and then, you know, is, I mean, am I good? Do I just live however I want? And that is an awesome question and I've kind of put you guys off. You know, the last couple of weeks I've been saying we're going to answer that next week. Somebody came up to me last week and they were like, this is like an episode of Dallas. Who <laughs> shot JR, right? So, okay, so here we go. We're going to answer these questions. And to do that, we're going to look at Galatians. Now, in, in Galatians chapter 5, uh, this exact same issue came up, the same question came up, and, and uh, Paul is going to answer it here in verse 13. Now, now check it out. You, my brothers, were called to be free. Right? Don't, don't let anything else that he says after this take away from that point. You were called to be free. You were chosen and, and you were called to have these rules taken away from your life and not to live under those rules. But then what is he saying? But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature or the flesh. Don't use this freedom in Christ to indulge in your sinful nature. And last week we mentioned, you know, that the, 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 we have this part of us that's like the animal inside of us, the pig inside of us. And what, sa what sound does the flesh make? Oh, that was weak. That was really weak. No, we, we all have a pig inside of us, and that pig makes a... Oh, man. That's it. There, that's a little better. <laughs> really, really, I, I did this in Missouri, and uh, they all just... <laughs> they get it. So anyway, um, no, that's the, that's the part of us. We have this pig inside of us that just lives to gratify its own nature. And he's saying, don't use this freedom in Christ. Don't reuse the fact that Christ came to take away the rules to stick you back in the same position where you're indulging in the sinful nature. Now, verse 16. I'm going to skip down. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, or of the flesh, or of the pig. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. 
They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Okay, so there is this war inside of us. The Bible says that when we, we become children of God and we believe in God, there's this new thing that happens inside of us, and now there's this struggle. And there, as in most things in life, there is no better way to illustrate this at all than with Lord of the Rings, right? <laughs> so I want you to take a look at uh, just a scene from Lord of the Rings. Uh, this is Gollum, and as you can see, it's, it's the same exact thing that's happening right here in this passage of Scripture. to go away. And away he goes, precious. Gone, gone, gone. Smeagol's free. Okay, there's, there's two things that that reminds me of. First one is my mother-in-law. And the second... <laughs> uh, she doesn't watch my sermons online. So anyway, and then... No, no, the second thing is it's just a picture of Galatians. I honestly, when I was watching that for the first time in the theaters, I like teared up. I was like, that is... The war that we all have between this sinful nature, this flesh that goes inside of us, and then this, this Spirit of God leading us to this right way of living and, and this guidance. And so he says, these two things are absolutely contrary to each other. And he says, if we follow the Spirit, right, if we follow that Spirit, then we're not under the law. In other words, as we believe, as we believe, that is going to change the way that we live. Like, because anything you believe in changes. If you really believe in it, it changes you, right? So, for instance, we talk about Santa Claus, right? If you really believed, like, really believed that there was a magical man who came into your house without an invitation, right? And apparently had a thing for your kids, would that not change your behavior on December the 24th, right? I don't know about you, but every day December the 24th, we're going to a hotel, right? Or at least, I'll tell you this, I'm not going to sleep well that night because I know that there's this magical man that's going to come in our house and, and, and I'm going to stay up with a baseball bat, right? Your belief, like, changes your behavior. If I genuinely, authentically believed in Santa Claus, and the same is true, think about what the statement is. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. That's, that's a big statement. You're saying you believe that is truth, and that everything that he says is true, that he is the way, the truth, 
and the like. That's going to change who you are. So that belief, that belief changes your life. But don't get that confused. Because if immediately what we do is we start to jump to, oh, you know, God just wants us to do stuff. And, and very quickly we can end up under rules and laws and trying to earn our relationship with God by, by what we do. So here's what he says. Verse 22 now. I'm sorry, verse 19. So he, he describes this. He says, the acts of the sinful nature or the, the flesh or the pig or golem, right, are obvious. Sexual immorality impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, that's a heavy line. Because we, we, you know, we've been up here talking about belief, and it's all about believing. And then he comes along and he says, and then, and then there's all this list, and there's all these things. And if you live like this, you don't enter the kingdom of God. Because belief changes who you are. And so this isn't about measuring up. It's about the natural response. It's about the fruit of that decision and what that looks like. Your life will change if you make that decision. Now, he also says, verse 22... But the fruit of the Spirit, right? What you have if you have the Spirit inside you is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, Spirit let us keep in step with the Spirit. I just want to give you a perfect example of this. I, uh, several years ago, I was uh, leading a youth retreat, and I am by no means like a youth minister, okay? So I'm always out of my element when I go on these youth retreats. And so I'm there, and this is actually the first one I've ever been on, either as a kid or as an adult. And I'm there with about 20 kids by myself. That was stupid, okay? So I'm there, and I'm only about 23, right? There, and I'm hanging out with all these kids, and I have that, and I come to realize that a lot of these kids are like really messed up, and I am went way over my head. And somewhere along the lines, so this one girl came, and she, uh, she was actually dating a warlock, like a self-proclaimed warlock. And she, like, like wore, like, complete black clothes, the black makeup, and I mean, she just, she just looked like something out of a horror movie, right? Just every day when she walked around. And she came in, and she came to this conference. I don't know why she came to the conference, but she did. And we were there for a week, and you could just see kind of like a change in her life. Like, the first day, she was like... Just hated it, wasn't involved at all. The second day, she was a little bit lighter. The third day, she came to breakfast, and she had, like, changed her entire appearance. And it's not that appearance means all that much, but it's just that you could tell something inward was affecting what was happening outward. And she had borrowed her friend's clothes, and she came. And by the third day, or fourth day, she actually came to me and said, I want to be baptized. I was like... Well, cool, that's awesome, you know? And I sat down, I talked about belief and all this stuff we've been talking about. And then the next day she came up to me, and it was about two hours away from the time the, the baptism thing was going to happen, you know. And she comes up to me and she says, hey, I, uh, I, I, I don't want to do it. And I was like, you don't want to? No, I, no, you want to do it. You know, you want to do it. And, and i got to be honest with you a little bit. you got to know this about youth ministers, preachers, pastors. Baptisms are a little bit like a scalp, right? So you go to a youth event, you don't want to come back with no scalps, right? You come back, how many did you baptize? We baptized three. Hey, 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 you know. The, I, hate, I have to admit that was part of my thinking. But anyway, I was like, no, we, we got to get her baptized. And I really thought, you know, you, know, you want to make this decision, we got to make this decision. And so I was like, no, I, I think you want to. You said you wanted to last night. Let's go ahead and do it. So we got her in the baptistry, you know, and she's like on the edge of the bat. There's a big pool, right, that we we're going to do this in. And she comes up to the edge of it, and she's like, I, I don't know what I want to do. And I'm ashamed. I'm, again, I'm only 23. I was just almost like, you know, kick her in the pool. <laughs> Like, you are getting baptized, right? You know, and she, she, you know, we baptized her and she came back and she made this decision and it was a big moment. Like all the youth group huddled around her and you could tell she was just free and excited and she came home and, and for her, belief just didn't mean like checking a box. It meant, number one, the first thing for her, probably the only thing on her plate was when she came home, belief meant getting rid of the warlock boyfriend, Right? 
I thought about like getting rid of the warlock boyfriend, but we came home and uh, and she said that that's what she was going to do. She knew if she was going to follow Jesus, that that's what that meant. She's going to follow the Spirit. We come home, and I see her a week later. She's just back to her old look. She's back to her uh, boyfriend, and uh, she even in that course of time had already started cutting herself and stuff. And it was just like she just went right right back. She wanted to. She had the desire to. She knew that Jesus was real, but she, she didn't take that step to put her full belief in and follow. That full belief is following the Spirit of God. And so, so many people, and this is why a lot of times Christians get bad raps, and this is why people don't understand the Bible. It all comes down to this. There's a lot of people that like want to fill out the paperwork, right? Baptize, say the sinner's prayer, go to church, you know, whatever, whatever I got to do, you know, like, like, let's get this rolling. But so few make a decision with all of their heart and all of their soul and all of their mind to put their life into belief in Christ. So the answer to the question is, if I make this decision to believe in Christ, can I live however I want? My answer, yeah. Because God comes and changes you and fall. And if that belief is sincere, what are you going to want? You're going to want the things of the Spirit. You're going to want the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, so that's the, that's the answer to the first question. Now the second question kind of a solid, I think it naturally leads to this. The second question is, you're like, okay, so like, I made a decision to believe and um, like I still messed up, still sinned, made mistakes, like I'm still continually messing up. Like, does that mean like I didn't really believe? Does that mean because I don't, you know, all those fruits of the Spirit? Most people read the fruits of the Spirit that I read there in Galatians and it's like, uh, love, joy, peace, patience, I'm out. Patience. I'm out of patience, right? You know, you look at that and you're like, I don't, I don't know if that like defines or you know depicts my entire life. Does that mean I don't have the Spirit of God? And a lot of preachers or a lot of Christians would come and say, Oh no, no, that's not what that means. I think that's a great question. I think that's something you've got to ask yourself and you've got to look at your life. I don't think you just pass it by and go, Oh no, no, we're all sinners. We all make mistakes. You've got to really look at that question and honestly be able to answer it. I want to give you a couple of tools today, a couple of scriptures to be able to, to answer that question. The first one is in 1 Peter 3.21. Whenever I talk about baptism, I always bring up 1 Peter 3.21. Again, just to describe baptism, it's that like first step. When you believe, you make that decision, the first thing you want to do, you're going to want to be baptized. And, uh, and here's why. 1 Peter 3.21, it's talking about Noah and the flood, and it's, it's got all this imagery from the Old Testament, and these pictures, and, and so he's talking about the flood, and he says, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but a pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I like to pull out of there. That is a huge thing. When somebody makes a decision to believe or, or be baptized, I always pull that little line out. It is a pledge of a clear conscience before God. That is a huge, huge concept to get our minds around. Because I don't know about you. If I come to you and I say, hey, I want you to obey the Bible, like, I don't know if I can really do that. I don't even know what's all in there. But I, I don't know if I can obey every last thing in there. Also, if you come and say, hey, I want you to obey the systems that maybe your church or your culture, right? Because there's a lot of people in churches that believe some really weird things, okay? And, and want you to obey some really weird things. Just a real quick example. When I first came to Christian, I went to uh, Bible college. So there was kind of, you know, some, some goody goodies there. And, and I show up and I'm, I'm a brand new believer. And I had learned to replace cuss words because I was just like a poetry of cussing, okay? And then, and then I'd like change that so I would replace words with like heck and shoot and darn and flippin', right? <laughs> These were my replacement cuss words. And so this, this girl comes to me and says, you know, it's not only wrong to cuss, but it's wrong to replace those words with other words. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Have you really? And so I went to the Bible and I started starting to study that. And they're like, and then and then I found out there's a whole group of people that believe that. And there may be some of you that 
believe that here today. I mean, you know, you're wrong, but there's there's a there's a lot of people out there who are like expletives are wrong altogether. And I'm like, you mean I can't even? So what do I do? I just make a loud noise? Ah, that doesn't make any sense. So anyway. Long story short, there's a lot of people that have a lot of rules that they want you to follow. And so sometimes, you know, making the decision to believe, you're like, oh, okay, well, I got to do this, and I got to do this. And gonna... No. What, what you have to do is what the Bible tells you to do. In the Bible, 1 Peter 3, 21, it says, pledge a clear conscience before God. There is something so obtainable to me about that. Something that I can reach out. Something that I can say, yes, I can keep a clear conscience. And that doesn't mean that you won't do anything stupid or you won't make mistakes, but that you will recognize those mistakes. You will look at and you will do a clear, uh, you will have a clear conscience before God. That is a big thing that we pledge. And what happens in so many people's lives is we kind of feel guilty about stuff and we don't manage that guilt. See, I think all of us manage guilt, and so we kind of we just take that and we kind of kind of put it behind us and we put it behind us. And a lot of us learn to like live with guilt and go, well, I do, I do stuff wrong, you know, and I, I just, I can't even measure how, and so we're just managing all this guilt. And God says, really, all I want you to do is just come and pledge a clear conscience. Keep your conscience clear before me. Now, let me go one more step. That's the first tool. I think your top conscience is your absolute first tool that God's given you to kind of decipher that. Do I really believe? Do I have the Spirit of God? Am I following after Him? The second thing is in Hebrews chapter 10, and um, this is one of those oh crap verses, right? So if you're reading through the Bible and all of a sudden you get to Hebrews 10, you're like, oh crap, right? Okay, so we're going to look at that, and uh, Hebrews chapter 10, which is marked in the Bible. I'll just, I just want to warn you, it's a, it's a big, heavy verse. Verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. <laughs> he said it exactly. Oh, crap. So anyway, that's one of those big, heavy verses that you hear and you're like, wow, that's, that's a big statement. And so if you're trying to look at your life and, and weigh the sinful nature and look at the Spirit of God and where you're at in your relationship with God, I would just like to ask you to ask this one question. I would underline the word deliberately. Okay? Deliberately. What, what are you doing? Because there is a big difference between a sin of, of weakness or of shortcoming or of failure. Right? Because all of us do that. All of us make the mistake where we're like, we go against the very thing that we don't want to do. Right? And, and in fact, in Romans 7, Paul even describes that quite detailed in his life. He says, the things I want to do, those are the things I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, those are the things I end up doing. So it's one thing to have, have the right goal and then be weak. And it's another thing entirely to be deliberate. Right? To be deliberate with your sin and be like, yeah, I just sin, that's what I do, you know, it's not, everybody sins, right? Have you, that's, it's one of those statements that drives me crazy. Well, we're all sinners. And it's just like, oh, okay. And, and God comes along and he says, no, if, if you, if you make a decision to believe and, and say you want to follow me and then you deliberately like intentionally, like you think about it and you make that decision and you do it over and over and over again and there's not any turnaround or any repentance. Let me ask you that question. How sincere could that belief be? And in fact, it goes on. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Who has treated as unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. 
There's just something about that sincerity. And so today, as, as we come together and, and we ask those questions, you're like, can I, can I live however I want? And can I do? The question isn't about whether or not you measure up. The question comes down to your authenticity. Whether or not it's the real deal. God wants your faith to be real and God doesn't want to be mocked. So it's more than just checking a box. It's more than about getting wet. It's more than about going to church. It's what's happening in your soul as you come before God. And so I'd like to ask yourself that question. When it comes to your sin, I think that's a question we continually ask ourselves. Is this deliberate? And if it's deliberate, here's the most beautiful thing about sin and God and the belief in Him. You just repent. You just Stop. You just say, God, I did, I, I'm going to wipe my conscience clear. You can go in about 1.8 seconds from having a heavy, burdened conscience to completely clear. You know the feeling of a free conscience, right? There is nothing like the feeling of a free conscience. You can go from that by just taking that to God and saying, not only, God, do you give me forgiveness for this, but God, I'm not going to do that anymore. That's not how I want to live. I want to follow the Spirit and not the sinful nature. Let's pray. God, I pray, I pray today as we all look to you and your truth, I pray you'd weigh, uh, help us to weigh the sincerity of our belief. I pray you'd help us to understand uh, where we're at in our relationship with you. And God, I pray that you would put a burning desire and passion inside of all of us not to follow the sinful nature, but to follow your spirit and your truth. And I pray that in Christ's name. Amen.